In the summer of 1988, 13,000 workers set out to construct the longest sea tunnel in the world. Their mission was to connect the UK with France via an undersea route. However, there was one thing standing in their way, the very thing they hoped to cross, the English Channel. This infamous sea separates the south of UK from the north of France. For over a hundred years, many plans have been proposed to cross this sea, but have ultimately failed. Aware of its cursed history and the technical challenges, the engineers were still able to deliver the first of the seven modern wonders of the world, the Channel Tunnel. Today, if someone wants to travel between London and Paris, they can hop on the Eurostar and be there in two hours. This is all thanks to the Channel Tunnel, which is the only physical link between the UK and France. This is a project that took the lives of 10 workers, consumed a billion dollars, and almost broke two countries apart. The Channel Tunnel is a 31 miles long rail link connecting Folkestone in England with Calais City in France. It has the longest underwater portion of any tunnel in the world spanning up to 24 miles. This rail network also connects London with European destinations like Paris, Brussels, and even Amsterdam. It's crazy to think that you can travel from one country to another in a couple of hours using a train. This tunnel is the reason why airlines keep their prices as low as possible, as traveling by train is more comfortable and offers unlimited luggage options. And that the numbers prove it. Nearly 20 million people use this tunnel each year. The design of the Channel Tunnel is simple. It has three tubes, two for passenger and freight and a service tunnel in between. The service tube in the middle is 16 feet in diameter and lies 50 feet away from each rail tunnel. Since the tunnel is located at a depth of 140 feet below the sea, the water pressure on the tunnel is huge. The engineers had to build a tunnel strong enough to withstand this pressure. After fixed intervals, there are air ducts that equalize air pressure on both sides. In addition, the service tunnel isn't just used for emergencies or maintenance. It also provides ventilation to the entire infrastructure and is kept in a state of overpressure. In case of a fire in one of the railway tubes, the service tunnel would be safe from the fumes. Both railway tunnels are also connected to the service tunnel through cross passages that appear every 1,200 feet. Today, the channel tunnel is used by Eurostar trains and the shuttle service for cars. The freight trains that use the tunnel account for 26% of the trade between the UK and France. This translates to a $100 billion worth of goods each year. So it's safe to say that the Channel Tunnel is a vital link for the whole of Europe. To build the tunnel, engineers had to first decide on its location. The tunnel was constructed at the narrowest point of the English Channel to minimize its overall length. The selected route caused minimal disruption to shipping lanes and had a lower environmental impact. The next thing to figure out was the tunnel's depth. The geology of the English Channel is a bit complex. There are different layers of chalk and clay that make up its seabed. After extensive surveys, it was decided that the tunnel would be dug through the chalk marl layer. Chalk marl is a relatively soft and stable material for tunneling. This layer was less permeable and had fewer fissures compared to other geological formations. Once these two things were finalized, it was time to start construction. The service tunnel was the first one to be constructed. It served as a means to assess geological conditions and ensure safety during the excavation of the larger rail tunnels. Construction started earlier on the English side in December of 1987. Just two months later, digging began on the French side near Calais. The crew hoped that both tunnels would eventually meet in the middle. To dig through the rock, 11 tunnel boring machines or TBM were used. Five of them were used on the French side, while the remaining six were used by Britain. The TBM works similarly to an electrical drill. Each TBM consists of a cutter head that drills a tunnel through the chalk marl layer. The machines were capable of boring a diameter of 25 feet and could advance approximately 40 feet per day. Since there's no manual pressure to push the machines forward, TBM uses hydraulic pressure to advance. Within this giant monster is a conveyor belt that transfers the excavated rocks to the back of the machine. Nine million cubic meters of chalk were excavated from the tunnel during construction. This was used to enlarge the British Isles by 30 hectares to create Samphire Ho Country Park. Since the tunnel was being bored from both sides, there were fears that the two tunnels would never meet. However, the engineers proved everyone wrong. After two years of digging, both tunnels finally met. On an early morning in December, 
A French and British worker shook their hands and even exchanged flags. Big day for both of us. As the champagne flowed in probably the biggest ever underground party, the Entente was very cordial. I think that we're definitely moving closer and closer together. I think we've got to actually. Both tunnels aligned perfectly except for a two-foot deviation. This was an impressive engineering feat given the circumstances. The rest of the construction was completed quickly afterward and the first train test was conducted on December 1993. A few months later, the Channel Tunnel was officially opened in a ceremony attended by Queen Elizabeth and French President Francois Mitterrand. This event marked the commencement of the tunnel's regular services. The completion of the tunnel meant that the island of Great Britain could be connected with Europe for the first time since the Ice Age, about 8,000 years ago. On the surface, the Channel Tunnel appears to be a success story, but some of its aspects were heavily scrutinized. Initially expected to cost $6 billion, its actual cost had ballooned to $15 billion by the time of completion. Since both countries didn't want to burden the taxpayers with an experimental project like this, the tunnel was privately financed. This makes it the largest privately funded construction on the planet. During the construction, 10 people lost their lives mostly from accidents involving heavy machinery. The youngest victim was 19-year-old Andrew McKenna, who was hit by a locomotive in the Marine Service Tunnel. Another man was crushed to death by a boring machine when the equipment started suddenly. Since most of the victims were British, the UK was accused of sacrificing workers' safety. Five UK companies, Balfour Beatty Construction, Costain Civil Engineering, Tarmac Construction, Taylor Woodrow Construction, and Wimpy Major Projects were taken to court. Each company was fined 10,000 pounds, a figure that was considered too small given the death toll. The human loss was unfortunate but understandable since building an undersea tunnel is a dangerous feat. Before the Channel Tunnel was built, there were other alternatives proposed for crossing the English Channel. One of them was a long suspension bridge. So why was the tunnel design selected over the bridge? Before we tell you the reason, if you're a construction enthusiast, consider subscribing to our channel. We bring the latest news in the construction industry with two fun videos each week. The suspension bridge was discarded for multiple reasons. One is that building a bridge would be way more expensive than a tunnel. Second, the bridge would require alterations to the landscape and impact the local ecosystem. In contrast, an undersea tunnel minimizes disturbance and cuts out noise pollution associated with large bridge structures. Even if we sideline these arguments, the bridge would have to be several feet high to allow ships and ferries to pass through. This makes the whole process lengthy and technical for no reason. A tunnel would provide greater safety from rough weather conditions that are common to the English Channel. That's how the Eurotunnel design won against other proposals and was finalized by both governments. In 2007, the Channel Tunnel network was extended to London. Known as High Speed One, it allows even greater movement of traffic between Europe and the United Kingdom. As its name indicates, trains could reach speeds up to 186 miles per hour on this route. As of 2024, the Channel Tunnel is 30 years old. Since its opening, it has moved passengers six times the population of the UK. While the tunnel was conceived three decades ago, its actual plan was conceived 200 years ago. In the 19th century, a French engineer, Albert Favier, proposed a tunnel under the English Channel. His design included a two-level tunnel for horse-drawn carriages that was lit by oil lamps. Needless to say, Albert's design was way ahead of its time. He even envisioned an artificial island in the middle of the English Channel for changing horses. As expected, these plans couldn't materialize due to technological limitations. By the 1880s, there were serious efforts to build a fixed link between UK and France. That was partly because TBM machines were newly invented and people were eager to use them. A mile-long tunnel was dug from both sides beneath the English Channel. However, due to ongoing political pressures and safety concerns, the tunnel was eventually abandoned. The idea of a tunnel was revisited again during World War I. However, the British government was concerned that the tunnel could be used for surprise attacks. The UK also faced a lack of support from its public over the tunnel's construction. The British public harbored fears about increased immigration and financial strain. After facing countless rejections, no one was certain about the project's fate. However, the project got its big break in 1986 with the signing of the Treaty of Canterbury. 
This treaty allowed for private funding and construction without government financial backing. This marked a significant shift in cooperation between the two nations. The completion of the Channel Tunnel became a symbol of Franco-British cooperation. Before the tunnel, people had to rely on expensive steam ferries that had limited capacity and were vulnerable to weather changes. If you wanted to go from London to France, you first had to take a train to the port city of Dover. From Dover, you had to catch a ferry that took 90 minutes to reach France. Today, the same distance takes 35 minutes from the Channel Tunnel. In addition to convenience, the tunnel facilitated increased trade and tourism between the two nations. But the impact of the Channel Tunnel is really beyond economy or trade. This tunnel has brought a renaissance by shifting people's attitudes towards tunnels, especially in Europe. This shift in perception is exemplified by the Famernbelt Tunnel, currently under construction between Denmark and Germany. It will span approximately 11 miles beneath the Baltic Sea, connecting Rodbihavn in Denmark with Puttgarden in Germany. Upon completion, it would be the largest immersed tube tunnel in the world. An immersed tunnel simply means that parts of it would be built on land and later transferred onto the seabed. In this way, the Feymarn Belt Tunnel would consist of 89 concrete segments joined end to end. Much like the Channel Tunnel, Feymarn Belt would put the ferries out of business. A ride that takes 45 minutes by ferry will now only take 7 minutes by train or 10 minutes by car. This improvement is expected to enhance connectivity between Scandinavia and mainland Europe. We have made an exclusive video about this tunnel, so if you're interested, you can watch it here on our channel. Anyway, thanks for watching, and we will catch up in the next video.